74 people have died as a result of that fire in that hijacked building in downtown Johannesburg. Let's find out more about the history of this building at 80 Albert Street. It's a red brick heritage building that takes up almost an entire city block. And I'm joined now by David Fleminger of the Johannesburg Heritage Foundation. David, thank you so much for coming in. Such a tragic, tragic day. Um, if we look at the history of the building, I believe it was erected in 1954, this current red the brick current structure. Red brick structure yes. So it's almost 70 years old, um, uh, built by the city. What was its first use? Well, unfortunately, today's tragic events actually reflect a very tragic history for the building. The first building on the site was built just after the Anglo-Boer War by the British um, as a pass office. And it remained well, it uh, kept on being a pass office right up until the early 1950s when the apartheid regime really cranked up the pass laws and really, you know, they managed to blend their hatefulness with bureaucracy to quite staggering effect. So uh, it was substantially enlarged. The current building was built in 1954 and then enlarged again in the 1960s when the pass laws were applied to women as well as men. So they obviously needed more space to now process these people. And... Generally, the, the, the saying was, if you were called to 80 Albert Street, you were in big trouble. It was not a happy place. Right, so it wasn't just a place to process passes. What would happen there? There was a court, um, and if you were found wanting, if you, the pass laws, for those who are fortunately too young to remember, if you didn't have employment, you weren't allowed to overnight in the city. That was the bottom if line. Back. If you were uh, non-European, of course. Yes. Um, so... If you had a problem with your paperwork or you had uh, somebody, an employer, who needed to get their passport stamped so that you could stay on their property overnight, you had to go to the pass office. There was a court. There was a juvenile center. There was uh, mass processing of thousands and thousands of people. You either got an E for employed or an F for fired. If you got an F, you were told to leave the city within 72 hours or you were sent to work as a convict on a farm, a white-owned farm somewhere. So it was a place of trauma, it was a place of uh, fear, it was a place of inhumanity, quite frankly. And it maintained that, uh, that reputation up until the past system was abolished in 1986. I actually just remember as a young child going with my mother and our gardener to that past office and as a child, I didn't comprehend what was going on exactly, but you could see it was not a place, it was not a happy place. Mm. The building was very well built. It's got some nice detailing. The city engineers department of the time were known for building really strong, solid buildings. But it was not an inviting place. Yeah. So it's a really sad. A really sad place. So after the pass laws were abolished in 86, the building stood empty for a couple of years and the Transvaal Provincial Administration took over, uh, specifically the West Rand, West Rand Board, and after a couple of years of that, Usidiso Ministries came on and took the building over. And that was a really beautiful moment because they took the past court and turned it into uh, uh, a, a, a chapel. A, oh, chapel. a chapel. Okay. They turned it into a chapel. It became a woman's shelter. Okay. is what it became. But they took the past court, turned it into a shelter. They took the juvenile center and made it a skills training classroom. They painted the rooms. They gave uh, women and children hope and they gave them a place of safety and refuge. And that went on from 1994. In 2007, the Heritage Foundation was approached. Um, and one of the things that we do as the Heritage Foundation is we award blue plaques that go on the sides of buildings to commemorate sites that are historically sig significant. In this case, we felt it was worth uh, acknowledging this site for its terrible history and this rather beautiful transformation yeah. into a place. Almost a, a place of healing yeah. and a place of safety. So women and children uh, would be looked after under Usindisa Ministries. That's correct. When did that change? Is it clear? It's not clear. Our records show that uh, the Star newspaper re re was actually adopted uh, the, the shelter um, as part of their Mandela Day initiatives as, as late as 2010. So they were there painting rooms and refurbishing uh, the facilities. Sometime after that, and it's not quite clear exactly when, the building was hijacked and Usindiso was actually pushed out. Wow. That was the, that's the understanding that we have. And thereafter, the building just spiraled downwards. Um, so 
I mean, it's astonishing because this is a heritage site, so yes. it should have extra protection. Yes. Um, and then criminal elements come in, push out the legal tenants, Usindisa Ministries, doing a really good thing in the city, and no one stops them. That is the real concern, is that when these heritage buildings fall on hard times, whether they are hijacked or whether the, the whether the, whatever happens, we, we, we have them, especially in the inner city, which is facing its own set of challenges. So we have these heritage buildings under threat. Um, there needs to be some kind of coordinated action, mm. some plan, if nothing else, to try and prevent these buildings from falling further and further down the, the rabbit hole. What can you do as the Heritage Foundation? The Heritage Foundation is a, a wonderful organization. We volunteer run. We are an independent organization and our goal is to acknowledge, celebrate, promote heritage within the city as much as we can. However, we don't have any access to any real power, if, if I may say it like that. So we can make a noise, we can shout, we can write articles, we can write to authorities to say this is the situation, this is happening. But it is beyond our mandate to actually go into a building and save it or rescue it in any way. So we, who, do you, who do you appeal to? It depends uh, who we appeal to. Uh, sometimes it is the city council itself, mm -hmm. if it's a department within the city council. Sometimes it is the Johannesburg Property Company, which is responsible for managing the city's 20,000 properties. The, the, it's a huge portfolio and it's a very difficult job because they are all over the place and in various states of uh, repair. Mm -hmm. So it's a, we understand it's a huge um, portfolio. But we offer consulting, we offer advice, we offer as much support as we can. But unfortunately, we cannot be the ones to actually go in. Yeah, sure. And How concerned are you about the other buildings, the other heritage sites in Joburg? They vary. Some heritage sites have good landowners, uh, good property owners who are maintaining the sites beautifully and we celebrate those and we often do tours to those buildings. Other buildings are in a more precarious state. Um, I will say that we have had recently um, a very good interaction with the Johannesburg Property Company on the Rissick Street Post Office. That is another heritage building, 1903, beautiful yeah. Edwardian structure, very famous building right across from City Hall been a terrible state for many years. We are now working with them to try and find let's, active yeah. solutions. Let, let's really hope, David, that, that more comes out of this because um, the reality is if this heritage site had been properly looked after, these people would not have died overnight. That's the sad reality. Absolutely. Um, I just want to thank you so much for coming in. Uh, David Fleminger, he's from the Johannesburg Heritage Foundation. And the reality is that this started as a past building. It had a court. It had a terrible history. Um, there was a moment of redemption when it became a shelter and then it was taken over by criminals and today it is a place once more of terrible tragedy. 74 people have died.